Her speech was one of the best ever given at a leadership convention. Her ground game was professional. And in the end, Gerard Kennedy, Charles Souza, Eric Hoskins, and let's not forget Glenn Murray, all ended up in Kathleen Wynne's corner. Yes, Wynne won. Now what? To debate that, we're joined by Tim Murphy, former Liberal MPP, party president, now a lawyer at Macmillan LLP. Paul Rhodes, charter member of the Common Sense Revolution, now a communications consultant. Howard Hampton, former leader of the Ontario NDP, now a lawyer with Faskin Martineau. Judith Van Veldhausen, deputy leader of the Green Party of Ontario. And Martin Redcon, political columnist for the Toronto Star at Queen's Park. And it's great to have everybody around this table for a post-mortem and a look ahead at things uh, Ontario at the moment. I just want to start by just playing back some of the interview that I did with Kathleen Wynne after her victory at Maple Leaf Gardens at the weekend. So let's roll that tape, then we'll come back and chat. Roll tape. The first question is pretty simple. Can you believe this? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. There's a... Uh, it's, it's, there's a surreal quality to it, you know? You, you just sort of can't really believe it. And the thing about, a ca thing about a campaign is that it's so focused, you know? You are focusing on every day, performing, and of course you're thinking about the end goal, but for me, it's getting through each day and s keeping my energy up and saying the things I need to say and meeting the people I need to meet. And, and then when you've done everything you can do, then you, you wait for the results. But, but there isn't really a lot of reflection time during the, uh, the campaign. The only thing I did, you know, I did write my speech. About three weeks ago, I, I wrote the speech that I was going to give here, and then I gave it to the people who were going to edit it and change it and do all of that. But I really wanted to get the framework of what I was going to say down on paper, because I kept waking up at 3 in the morning thinking, I'm going to say this. And I thought, OK, I'm just going to get up and write the thing. So I did. And, uh, and so that actually took a load off my mind thinking about what I was going to be doing here today. A couple of quotes I want to share with you in, in uh, the lead up to this question. Uh, Bobby Kennedy used to say, uh, if you've got a problem, shine a lantern on it. David Peterson was in that chair a few hour, well, more than a few hours ago now and when he said that uh, his wife Shelley has an expression that if you've got a skeleton in the closet, as he called it, drag it out and dance with it. Kay. You took a big risk in your speech to absolutely go face on on the issue that I guess a lot of people have been whispering about, right. namely your sexual orientation, and I want to know why you decided to, to hit that so hard. Because I wanted everybody in the province to know, I wanted every member of the Liberal Party to know who I am and how I am going to deal with issues. And you know, it had been raised so many times in the press and it just was something that even though people knew, it didn't seem to go away. It didn't seem to be something that everybody could just say, oh, well, we can set that aside. It kept coming up. And so I thought, you know, I'm going to come into the convention and I'm going to lay it on the table and make it so clear that people have to make a decision about whether they're ready to accept that or not. Anybody in your campaign tell you not to do it? No. No. They knew better than to they do that. They knew better. <laughs> they knew you wanted to do they it knew. and therefore exactly. it was a done deal. Exactly. How do you think the speech went? I was very happy with it. I was very happy. I felt, I felt that I did it exactly the way I wanted to. Um, of course, there'd been lots of practice and mm. uh, you never quite know how it's going to go. Lots of practice and you flubbed the the kickoff I line. I know, yeah. I know. The kicker at the you end see, there. see, you just never know what's <laughs> going to happen. Although you recovered so nicely and so <laughs> authentically that it Actually, went Actually, somebody nicely. asked me if, uh, if that was planned. <laughs> to blow the last <laughs> yeah. line? I said, no, not <laughs> no, really. <laughs> no. Uh, consensus in the room, obviously, you've heard. It was the best speech of the day by far. Do you think that helped in subsequent ballots? I think uh, what, what some people said to me was that um, for folks who didn't know me, the speech really helped them to see that side of me. You know, there's, mm. been, this, there's been this kind of um, talk about, well, is she feisty enough? Is she able to confront issues? Is she, be able, is she able to speak out and be strong? And I really, I wanted to show people my version of that. You know, I'm, I'm different than the other candidates. We all have our own styles. But I have my own version of feistiness and my own version of strength. And I wanted people to see that because I think, I think that that inner resolve is what I bring to this job. Uh, not necessarily a huge shock that Eric Hoskins went to you. Uh, yes, a bit of a shock that Charles Souza went to you. How'd that happen? Well, Charles and I have had lots of conversations over the last three months, you know, and he, uh, our value system is not very far apart. And I, uh, I think that, again, in the same way that 
um, rumors and, and characterizations grow up during these, uh, these things. A characterization of him that wasn't necessarily accurate had, had been created. So when, did you know when he, he was and coming? I talked, when he and I talked, it was like, you know, is it this center right thing? You're center left, I'm center right. You know, is that really where we are? And I think there's much more commonality. But the other side of it is, he gets how important it is, and I get how important it is, that we have a balance, you know, that we have people who have slightly different views of the world. So I think it's a, it's a good, it was a good, uh, it was a good moment for us, for sure. The job ahead. Yes. Who's your first phone call to tomorrow? Well, actually, I just had a conversation with Tim Hudak. He, Already? He reached out, yes, he called, and uh, I had said I was going to call both Tim and uh, Andrew Horvath tomorrow, but Tim already called me, and we we're going to try to get together on Monday. He's around on Monday. Was it anything more than kind of congrats, courtesy call, that type of thing? Well, we both agreed that uh, he and I, actually, <laughs> Tim has lived in the neighborhood that I live in for in North Toronto for huh. a while. So every now and then when I'm running, I'll see him out walking his dog. When so now, when you say running, you don't mean for office. You mean actually, I mean actually with jogging, your legs. Yeah, jogging, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, so we've had you know we've had casual interactions, and you know we acknowledge that we both have had good conversations in the past. So who knows? We are uh, we will have a conversation on Monday, and I hope to talk to Andrew Horvath either tonight or tomorrow. What do you do about Sandra Pupatello now? Well, I'm going to, you know, before I meet with, uh, with the leaders of the opposition, I'm going to be meeting with all of my colleague candidates and just finding out where they're at and uh, taking stock of that situation because I don't know exactly what they all want to do. I don't know what Sandra and Gerard are going to do, for example, but uh, I look forward to talking to them. If she were to say, yeah, sure, I'll run in a by-election and come back to public life if you make me finance minister, what would you say to her? <laughs> Well, <laughs> I'm not going to play that version of let's make a deal, <laughs> but I hope, I hope she will run. It would be great if she would run. You would like her to run? I would like her to run. I would like her to be part of the caucus and cabinet. Uh, w would she have the senior most job in your cabinet if she were to run? You know what? I, I, I have to build a cabinet, Steve, mm -hmm. and you know, you've, you've studied politics, you know that that is the hardest job that a Premier has to do, mm -hmm. and it has to be done with, with care and consideration, and so I need to find out where everybody's at, and I need to, I need to move the, the pieces of paper on the wall and figure out who, uh, who fits where based on what their talents are, what their experience is, and, uh, and what they're interested in doing. You have to, in relatively short order, bring the house back, have a throne speech, you've got a budget coming presumably a couple of months later, yeah. you're in a minority parliament, you've got a really hard job to build a cabinet because you've obviously got leadership candidate considerations, supporter yeah. consideration. I mean, you've got a mountain of work ahead of you and you've said you want to be the agriculture minister as well. So... How are you <laughs> going to do all this? So, I am, um, I have said that and I, I believe that it is the right thing to do. There will be a strong parliamentary assistant. There will be, there is a strong deputy minister in the Ministry of Agriculture, and I will, I will take that guiding role because I think it's very important. As Dalton McGinty took innovation, research and innovation, when we first came to office, I think it's very important to shine a light on that file. I said I would take it for up to a year, Steve, so this is not a forever proposition, and it's a matter of the n whatever number of months that I think it's, is necessary to make sure that five Files like the uh, the wind turbine sightings, the uh, the horse racing industry, mm -hmm. um, making sure that getting the regulations, at least getting on a path to making sure that the regulations that are getting in the way of our agriculture, whatever those are, our agri food industry, um, I want to make sure that we're at least examining those things, and I want that directed from the premier's office. How's it going to feel the first time somebody calls you premier? <laughs> I probably won't turn my head. <laughs> I'll, be, be, looking I'll be looking for Dalton. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, we want to thank you very much for dropping by our station here at Maple Leaf Gardens, and we want to uh, offer you congratulations as well. Thank uh, you. you uh, all the candidates did, but you, uh, you also, the candidate you were on day one and the candidate you are today, those are two different people. I don't know if you appreciate that or know no, that, well but thank you. you all improved considerably. Somebody and said you did to too. me. Somebody said to me that, a leader is forged through a process like this, mm -hmm. and I uh, I do feel that I do feel that confidence. It's not arrogance; it's just a, a sort of solid belief in what I can do. And so I'm uh, I'm really happy to be able to bring that to the province. And I hope that uh, I hope that we'll be able to have conversations. I've I've said this a couple of times, and I'm, you know, 
I haven't had this conversation with you off camera, but um, I really think that it's important for the people of Ontario to have an opportunity to hear directly from the Premier, and I, I would hope that we can have a conversation about how that might happen. We'll watch and analyze. Okay. That's Excellent. Kathleen Wynne, incoming Premier, 25th Premier in the history of the province of Ontario, and need we say it, the first woman to ever have the job. Thanks so Thank much you. for stopping by. Thanks, Steve. Saturday night around 10 o'clock at Maple Leaf Gardens. Okay, let's get to this. The first question may be a bit odd, but I remember at the 2006 Federal Liberal Leadership Convention, Tim Murphy, I'm sure you were there, yes. in Montreal, the convention picked Stéphane Zion, mm -hmm. and it seemed to me that when about 24 hours, there was buyer's remorse already. Mm -hmm. So I ask, given the challenges that the Liberal Party of Ontario has right now, did the convention make the right choice? I think, the, uh, yes, is the short answer, because I think what we see is, uh, you know, a, I mean, look, Democracy always picks the right answer. Uh, and uh, I think what we've seen is, you know, I, the same, I remember when Murray Elston and Lynn McLeod ran, and we were at that last ballot, it was eight votes apart, and frankly, all of us had both of the, uh, their pins in our pocket, whichever one, that's the one we we're going to put on. And the same was true here, that there was uh, lots of uh, support and affection for both Kathleen and Sandra, and a willingness of everyone to say, we've got actually two tremendous candidates in these two women, you know, skilled, smart, intelligent, articulate, experienced. I mean, that's quite amazing, and very happy to put either button on. And as you saw from the interview, you know, an articulate, caring, uh, Ontario-focused person who brings a lot of talent and skill to the job. I'm actually going to let you get away with that Thank uh, answer you. for now, but yeah. we are going to drill down <laughs> a little deeper as we go along. Okay, Paul Rhodes, did they make the right choice? They did for uh, the Conservative Party of Ontario. How so? Um, because Sandra Pupatella, uh, who I got to know when uh, she was uh, an MPP, is a talented, committed, excellent politician, but she was talking about jobs in the economy and reaching out to rural Ontario. And I think that was the biggest threat to Tim Hudak, that issue matrix, and the ability that she would have to be able to draw votes in rural Ontario. Kathleen Wynne, I don't think, brings the same qualities to the table. Howard Hampton, did they make the right choice? Well, I, I think for the Liberal Party as it exists today, it was the right choice. Uh, the Liberal Party's been basically reduced to pretty much an urban party. Uh, a lot of the seats are in the greater Toronto area. And I think Kathleen Wynne will speak to, uh, to that audience and speak mm -hmm. to it well. But uh, does she have the capacity to grow the Liberal Party in rural Ontario, in small town Ontario, small city Ontario, in northern Ontario? I think it's going to be a little more difficult to uh, sell. I just, I, I, think, uh, I think the world of Kathleen is a person because I've, I've worked with her, I've dealt with her on issues. And I think she's very good. But um, I think the Liberal Party suffers from what I would call some downtown Toronto-itis right now. And I don't see that she has the capacity to get outside that. Judith Van Veldhausen. I think they made the right choice. I feel that uh, Kathleen has said on a number of occasions that she's committed to working with the other parties. And I think that's exactly what we need right now. We need that strong leadership uh, at Queen's Park. And if she's willing to reach out to the other leaders and uh, build some bridges, that we definitely will make some, some inroads there. Martin Redcon. I thought Howard Hampton gave the best answer because he described her as somebody who he finds personally quite compelling and articulate. But where I think he was wrong was in not understanding that if, he can, if she can reach out to a northerner like Mr. Hampton, why can't she reach out to other northerners? I, I wouldn't sell northerners short. I'm married to one. I'm married to someone from Thunder Bay. And I think Kathleen Wynne probably has a bit of a sales job ahead of her. What she has is a chance because she's the premier. She's not an opposition leader. As premier, as long as the opposition gives her a little time, in the job and doesn't rush to an election that nobody seems to want and they say they don't want. She has a bit of a showcase now. So there is a, you know, she's an interesting character in that she doesn't always make the most dramatic first impression, but I find that she makes a pretty strong second impression. So if she gets a second chance or a chance, she might actually surprise people. I wouldn't underestimate her. I don't want to do too much convention post-mortem because we do want to look ahead and see what her victory portends. However, comma, we do have to look back, Mr. Murphy, a little bit. Fair enough. Uh, and let's just go through this. The, so the, Martin's paper today is filled with stories about how Eric Hoskins and Sandra Pupatello, whom you backed, had a deal in stone. And nevertheless, Eric Hoskins dropped off the ballot and went to Kathleen Wynne. Can you shed any light on that for us? Sure, I think they, uh, I know that Sandra and Eric met and had a very good conversation, like they really hit it off uh, and had a conversation about politics in the direction of the province that I think surprised Eric, frankly. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously Eric came from a, 
you know, a, a, a group of partisans who were probably generally more inclined to Kathleen. Uh, but I think he was genuinely surprised by the degree of affection and political simpatico he had with Sandra. Um, I think, frankly, at the end of the day, the thing that uh, moved him uh, was the closeness of the ballot results in the first ballot. That I think he uh, got a little nervous in the face of that. And I know, for example, Deb Matthews, uh, to your point about the speech, went to him in the box and said, "Look, you know the the." Uh, you know, the progressive uh, forces that you are in part a voice for are going to want to see you support the candidate who made that kind of speech. And I think, uh, you know, both the narrowness of that and some of that kind of narrative uh, helped change his mind, which so, people have the prerogative to do in politics, well, and so, sometimes even do. So Sandra's bringing him a chocolate cake at his home and enjoying mm -hmm. the fellowship and enjoying all that, and Sandra's paying, <coughs> we heard in Martin's paper, $20,000 to help bring delegates or whatever all of that is about. Yeah. There was an understanding that that meant you got to support Sandra on the first ballot, and he didn't. So, how much? What are the hard feelings like today? Well, I mean, look, uh, there's always uh, hard feelings after any convention. I think, though, they're not going to last very long. Frankly, I think the Liberal Party as a whole is uh, content with the result, wants to get behind Kathleen, uh, and, and will. And so, I, you know what, people. Uh, you know, you want your. It was an interesting campaign to be a part of, and an interesting process. Because what I actually liked about it, frankly, was it was a bunch of people coming and advocating on behalf of their candidate, not denigrating anyone else. And there wasn't really any of that. Trust me, I've been parts and seen well, campaigns where that. This right? was pretty collegial. And, and, these and well. yeah, and so that was really nice. And so I think there was there's none of that uh, residual uh, mm -hmm. anger, uh, frustration that really that I can see. I mean, people get their feelings hurt a little bit, but the party's made a choice, and people I think are behind the choice. Except that Paul, as we've heard, Sandra Pupatello did expect Eric Hoskins to come to her, and she did expect Charles Souza to come to her, and neither of those things happened. So based on your convention experiences, how long does it take to get over these? Slights. Everything that Tim Murphy said, I have heard those words come out of my mouth <laughs> in previous <laughs> hard thought, and, and, uh. and it's as much a belief as it is a hope. But these things last for a very, very long time. Uh, a lot of the liberal, and I use the word cautiously, establishment supported Sandra Pupatello. She was the candidate that was going to maintain that strong liberal center. She was the one talking about economy and jobs. And for her not to succeed, I think, is a bit of a repudiation of the, the liberal establishment around Dalton. And by the same token, a message to anyone who doesn't live in 416 that liberals aren't really all that interested in what your issues are. And the, and the decision to be the Minister of Agriculture for a year, I think, is naive and a bit patronizing. Let me just follow up on this establishment angle, because I, I've heard from people in the Pupatello campaign that the notion that she was the choice of the establishment was really not true. And if you look at the efforts, I think, by David Peterson, by Greg Sorbera, to get Eric Hoskins to go to, Sandra, to, go to um, Kathleen Wynne, I mean, that suggests that the establishment of the party was with Wynne, doesn't it? Deb Matthews is a part of the party establishment. She's a former party president. Look, I, if I were Tim Hudak and I heard Paul Rhodes say that the wounds had not healed after a leadership campaign or take a long time to heal, I'd be, I'd be a little worried. Look, the... I don't think this was, this was a pretty collegial and tame affair by leadership standards. And I, I don't see Kathleen Wynne as a, as, as a force of retribution and rage and uh, scorched earth policy. So I, I think they'll get their act together. Sandra, Pupat Sandra Pupatella was on the radio already this morning saying we had a deal, Hoskins went back on it, and she's not happy about it. True. But she's not in cabinet. Gerard Kennedy's not in cabinet. and and and. Kathleen Wynne is the premier, and she has the power, and people tend to respond to power. Howard Hampton, you obviously ran and won in a leadership convention um, against Francis Lincoln. How long does it take for the wounds of those things to heal? There are always bruised egos after leadership conventions because all politicians have egos. If they didn't have an ego, they wouldn't be in the job. <laughs> this just in. <laughs> and there are always the bruised egos. Yeah, but yeah. if I may, I don't think that's. Uh, I, I think those are going to be relatively small potatoes for Kathleen Wynne. I think the bigger issues for her uh, are going to be this. Um, and I had this conversation with Ernie Eves. I said, Ernie, why didn't you call the election two weeks after you were elected leader? You were never more popular. Uh, I said, the longer you sat as premier, the more you had to take on the baggage that Mike Harris left behind you. Let me tell you, Dalton McGinty's leaving behind a lot of baggage. There's some very, very difficult issues. The orange stuff is not going away. The uh, electricity stuff is bigger. The Ontario Power Authority has signed contracts for $27 billion. And like Orange, you can't ask what's in those contracts. 
I, let me tell you, I think there are some stinkers in some of those contracts. And H Kathleen Wynne will have to handle all of that. So you're urging her to call an election no, ASAP? I, no, I, I, no, I think, no, I think the conundrum for her is this. Uh, is, uh, part of it is, you know, gee, should I go now, do a throne speech, go now, and uh, try to, uh, you know, come present myself as the new leader, new ideas, new image, new future? Or do I stay in the House for six months, a year, and risk having to hang, handle a lot of baggage that's not very pleasant. Paul? Ernie Eves will tell you the exact same thing. His uh, mistake was not the, going his faster. His mistake was not going early. But mm -hmm. that, that requires a significant amount of organization and a degree of political courage. Because the only way that election can occur is if she precipitates it with the, the two opposition parties. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I agree. I mean, there's a, the, the, there, is, there should be a desire to do it, but she has a lot of work in front of her because having gone through this with two previous premiers, there's the cabinet selections, there's all of those hurt feelings, there's bringing the party together, there's raising money, there's writing a throne speech, there's getting a budget online, there's bringing the house back. Oh, and if she has a minute, being Minister of Agriculture, too. So, I mean, she's got a p pretty full plate. Well, well, and then, then to look at a depleted party and say, oh, and by the way, we want to do an election campaign, every pressure she's internally would be decision. against that. I mean, let's be clear, she's already told us what she's going to do, which she wants to go back to the House and make it work. And she's acting on that today, has mm -hmm. articulated that viewpoint. So that, I, and, and I mean, that makes nice me and Howard feel very good. I, I'm glad you feel good, but she's actually, so, so what you're doing is complaining about the fact that she's made a decision in the interest of Ontarians no, no. rather than her partisan interests. I actually give her full credit. She says, look, what matters to Ontarians is not that I call an election my own interest, is actually we get this right and we do things in the interest of Ontario. And that's what she was telegraphing and that's what she's doing. So already we're seeing someone who's deciding in the interest of Ontario and acting on what you said. Hey, that's pretty impressive. I'll take that any day. Let me get Judith. What, what is your sense about whether the public of this province is champing at the bit to have an election so that they can get rid of the Liberals? I think, I think nobody wants to see an election. And nobody inside the House and outside of the House wants to see an election again. <clears throat> We had a federal election, municipal election, provincial election, all back to back. I think people are tired of hearing knocking on their doors and phone calls and robocalls and all that stuff. We want to just have some work done, get the teachers back to the table. Let's get some decisions made. Let's focus on Ontarians and, and, and fix things that have been going so a little so stability is in, in the offing, you Absolutely. think? Absolutely. I've heard that through and through. And you've knocked on a lot of doors. I mean, you ran in the last election. Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah. And so people you know. don't want to see me again. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to see me again. Steve, they don't want to see you. Okay, Martin. Okay. I'm sure they do. And, and, but to <laughs> Paul's point, if Pat, I can cite examples of people who did run elections right away. Remember John Turner? He had an option. He chose the wrong one. Um, there are, Kim if, if, if Kim Campbell, another one. She Thank didn't you. have an option. Um, <laughs> she so ran out of time. The past performance is no predictor of future outcomes. If it were, we would not have Kathleen Wynne as the first woman mm -hmm. Premier of Ontario. So you can't look backwards, you've got to look forwards. And I think Judith has articulated that. People don't want an election. If the Tories want an election, if the NDP wants an election, they have the power. They can force the election. It isn't really Kathleen Wynne's call. It's the opposition's call because it's a minority government. That's what people chose. And according to the NDP, they want to make minority work. According to Mr. Hudak today, he wants to move forward on jobs and the economy. Why would Kathleen Wynne dissent from that? One more thing on the, just on the convention, then we'll wrap it up. That speech, I suggested off the top, that's one of the best convention speeches I've ever seen. And uh, it was very personal, it was very authentic, and it certainly appeared to move votes at that convention. There will have been a lot of Ontarians who haven't really followed it all that carefully, but now that is, the decision's been made, they may want to go back and look at that speech. As a here's who I am people kind of a speech, Tim, how'd you do? Great. Absolutely. It was a very good speech, unquestionably. I think it was, you know, it was about revealing who she is, her motivations. I mean, look, when you're actually, I think a lot of people uh, understand when they're voting for a party and a leader that they're not voting for a particular policy. They're voting ultimately, do I trust this person to make a decision in the context that I'm going to be comfortable, they bring the right values and motivations to it. And so part of what you're doing when you're, frankly, at that point, introducing yourself to the public is saying, here's the values and motivations that I bring to the table, and I hope you'll go, yeah, actually, I kind of like them and understand them. So absolutely, she, uh, she did, it was a great speech. Uh, you know, and it was, uh, it was uh, unquestionably people responded to it on the floor. Um, frankly, I think the narrowness of the margin between her and, and uh, Sandra on the first ballot had more to do with the eventual result. I think the speech reinforced that uh, trend because, but, you know, because it helped the momentum that clearly 
uh, uh, Kathleen had out of that first ballot. It was a great speech. I think uh, people wake up the next day looking at that and saying, I feel better about who that person is. You, you didn't see it, did you? You didn't watch the convention. No, I didn't. I was one of those Ontarians who didn't see it. it was... <laughs> Not going to stop from speaking about it, though. <laughs> oh, no, I agree with Toronto Star. I am perfectly informed on the Liberal Party of Ontario. Yeah. Well, well you've got to go to her website and exactly check it out. Yeah. It wasn't bad at all. Howard, I mean, Howard, she, made, she took uh, what she said was actually no risk at all because she wrote the speech and felt she needed to say what she said. But it was very personal. And as a guy who's given that speech at a convention, how tough is it to be that personal in front of thousands of people? Well, I, look, uh, you know, I, if, if you really want to communicate with people, that's what you have to do. And I think she deserves credit and congratulations for that. But, but let's not fool ourselves. The next election is not going to be about a speech, right? I mean, uh, Kathleen is a pretty good communicator. Uh, and I think you know, she will, that will do her well. But um, the next election is not going to be about a speech. It's going to be about much more than that. I mean, Ontario, is, in many ways, is uh, at, at some difficult crossroads. And uh, I think a lot of people out there will say, well, this is interesting. Uh, it, it does represent, certainly, a change for the Ontario Liberal Party. Um, but I, I think Kathleen's going to have to present a much deeper and broader image uh, in terms of the people of Ontario. Well, let's get to that because I, I've got a clip I want to play right now and obviously the big question going forward today is can she do what she said she would do, which is in essence being able to reach out to the other two parties and keep this House, make minority parliament work in essence. Uh, she was on the program during the course of her campaign. We talked about that. Here's a clip. Roll tape, please. Honestly, I haven't talked about coalition. That's something that has come at me from, uh, from the media. I haven't heard anybody else talking about coalition. But what I am clear about is that it is going to be up to me and to Tim Hudak and to Andrea Horvath to have a conversation about how we can or cannot work together. I'm willing to work with one or both of them. Um, but the, the nature of that conversation and what it will lead to has got to be He's got to be with all of us. It's not for me to say, this is what I want to do, you know? This is, this is how I see it. That's not the kind of leadership that I bring. It's not the kind of leader that I am. I, I want us to work collaboratively, and I want us to co-create whatever that, uh, whatever that go-forward position is going to be. Okay, let me get everybody up to speed here. She spoke to Tim Hudak Saturday night at the convention, in fact, just before she did the interview with us. She spoke to Andrea Horvath earlier today. The progressive conservatives are already running attack ads against her, saying that she is just another overspending McGinty type. The NDP have thrown down a gauntlet of their own, saying that if you want minority parliament to work, let's have a public inquiry on the whole gas plant cancellation issue. <coughs> so that's where we are at the moment. Martin, does this sound to you like a prescription for a minority parliament that can work? I think the ambition, the goal makes sense. I think the reaction this morning was a bit of a surprise. I, I don't think there's any personal animus between the leaders. I think it's interesting that Kathleen Wynne has outed Mr. Hudak as a Torontonian who lives in her riding in North Toronto in a comfortable area and isn't out in the farms um, all the time. I, I think that by running an attack ad today, well, it's not that bad of that. I've listened to it. It's a radio ad. It talks about the economy and says that Ontario's unemployment rate is higher than the national average. Well, guess what? Every province east of Manitoba that doesn't have oil in the ground has a higher unemployment rate, and it's lower than the American unemployment rate. Okay, fair point, but on the first day, the optics, I think, are a little questionable to go to try to frame her because it conjures up, perhaps unfairly, images of, or recollections of how the Tories federally tried to put Stefan Dion in a box and put Mike Lagnatif in a box. So there's a fair play element that I think Ontarians are going to be sensitive to, and the opposition has to be careful. They're trying to frame her as another big spinning liberal, basically. Yeah, another Dalton McGuinty. Hmm. Uh, I think she's a little bit different, and we'll see how much she has baggage. Absolutely, lots of baggage. But, but and, and, and Andrew Horvath has raised this idea of having an independent inquiry into the gas plant cancellations. Wow. Why would we want to have, why would Kathleen Wynne agree to another Gomery inquiry? Why, would, why wouldn't we just wait for the Auditor General, whom everyone trusts, to deliver his report in March? Why would we spend $50 million on a public inquiry, as in Cornwall, to find out about a $200 million plant cancellation? It was a dumb thing to, 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 can, to excuse me, dumb idea to cancel the plant, but it'd be, it's exactly what the NDP asked them to do. 
in a cynical way during an election, but a, a, a public inquiry, why don't we get MPPs to work in committee and get the Auditor General to testify in committee and hold the Liberals' feet to the fire? Let me get Judith. Uh, do, do the circumstances, in your view, are they in place for a minority parliament to work better? I think electing Kathleen was important first step. My interactions with her, having met her, she is definitely the person for the job in terms of connecting people. She's really passionate about her work. Every time I've spoken with her, she's, she's always taken time to speak with me, even though you know I'm just an aspiring MPP. And uh, I think that there's definitely a chance here and that these attack ads are just, um, I guess, is what has been expected of the parties. But uh, I think they're all fluff. Let me ask Paul about that. I mean, the, the this is day one of the incoming premier's new role as Liberal Party leader. And there's an attack ad out already. Um, so much for a honeymoon, eh? Welcome to the NFL. This is the way <laughs> politics works. Uh, I think that to Judith's point, of all of the candidates, Kathleen is the one that is most likely to make a minority parliament work for a while. I think she's, she has that effect and is, is willing to listen. Uh, by the same token, while people don't want an election, do they want another year of the kind of legislature that we had uh, in, in Ontario, where very little got done? Uh, there was a lot of rancor, a lot of unpleasant things happening. So I, I think if uh, of the candidates, the one that can make a minority parliament work, it's uh, Kathleen Wynne. I think she has that ability. Uh, but all that baggage comes along with her, both hers and the entire parties. Uh, so this is the way politics is done in the modern age. Um, you, you might like to think it would be nicer, but uh, it really isn't. Let me get Howard, because I want you to hear what everybody has to say, yeah, then I'll yeah. give you a chance to... to uh, Andrea Horvath at her news conference today, your successor, Andrea yeah. Horvath, she, um, she basically said, Kathleen Wynne, if you want this legislature to work, then let's take the whole gas plant issue out of the legislative contempt place, let's kick it over to a public inquiry, let's have it report in six months, which if there's a fall election would come just on the, <laughs> you know, on the eve of that election, was that helpful? Uh, well, look. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> whether something is whether something is helpful or not, I I don't think uh, you know you can debate that. Uh, I don't think it's going to get you anywhere. You're, you're going to see a, a, a lot of positioning things. All right, for Andrea Horvath in the NDP, I think there is a sincere desire to work with the new premier. I think there is, but if you don't have a place to put you know, these electricity issues for a while, they're going to be the topic of question period, and they're going to be the topic of committees, and they're just going to keep coming up and coming up and coming up, and it will be, it will be right back to the, you blew the money, uh, you made a bad deal, uh, you uh, let down the, the rate payers of Ontario so every, every day in question period. So, so I think there's a, there's a constructive attempt here. There's a constructive attempt to say, look, don't have this as the fodder every day for question period. Send it off to a royal commission. And that depoliticizes it? No, <laughs> no, look, I mean, here's the magic of royal commission. Somebody gets up and says, I want to talk about the gas plant. And the answer is, we're going to hear from the commission in six months. Just before a potential fall election. <laughs> well, it may be. Again, that depoliticizes it? It may be before a potential fall election. You don't know that. No, I don't. But if, if you, yeah. that's the choice, I think one of the choices the new premier has. If you want this, as the fodder for question period every day and in question in, in committees every day then don't set up a commission okay Tim, but if you if, want if, it off the table for a while do you think there's then a, do a commission do you think there's a snowball's chance in hell she'll call a, 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 what, a public inquiry into this gas plant thing well my advice would be not on your life um, uh, for a couple of reasons one of which is my experience has been that a a public inquiry, uh, it, it actually doesn't stop the opposition from asking questions, just gives the government a different answer. That's all it does. But, to, you know, as Martin said, the <laughs> we elect MPs to do something. We've got 60,000 pages of documents that have been dumped on them in a public forum. They actually demanded the decision. The hypocrisy of this is a little stunning, but, you know, as I say, it's the NFL. As for the attack ads, I could not be happier. Because the, 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 the idea that I think Ontarians carry of Tim Hudak in their head is this kind of mean-spirited, old-style, 
hack and slash uh, Harris type Tory who, who hadn't quite grown up to someone who could run the province and he's reinforcing that image with attack ads right out of the gate instead of someone to come to the table and say I'm prepared to work together let's let's bring some statesman like well, skills. He and did he, call her. He, he was the first one to call her. He on called Saturday night. her. He called her in private and attacked her in public. I'm talking about his public behavior. His public behavior speak I mean frankly one of the problems with Tim Hudak some of the people who met him on, on privately say geez he's not the kind of guy I see in person because he continues to behave in public like someone who's not ready for prime time. There is a, 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 there's a school of thought that says you can't overstep on these things. Do you think the Conservatives have here? Uh, I, per, perhaps, but I wouldn't, say that, I, I wouldn't say that definitively. I mean, this is what, this is what parties do after uh, a, a new leader gets put in place. Uh, it is uh, a recognition that there is a political element to your job. Uh, Premier-elect win that you're going mm -hmm. to have to come to grips with. And but what are, happened to the notion of a honeymoon? Every new leader gets a honeymoon, don't they? Might be five minutes long, but at least they get one. Well, it's not the honeymoon. It's not the honeymoon that's given by the other parties. It's the honeymoon given by the public, by the voters. And we will see in the in the in the coming months whether Kathleen Wynne has a honeymoon or not. Can I rally to the defense of Tim Hudak and Paul Rhodes for just a moment? Wait a second. <laughs> Wait a second. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? I, I listened to the radio ad before coming on. It's on the internet, and you can go to uh, pcontario.blah. Ontariopc.net. And then go to the ad. It's not that Do bad of that. Okay, it, it's it's, it's okay. a civili it's a civilized ad. What I think the takeaway from this is that people are pouncing in the media and fair-minded people because what it's day one and there's an ad against her already. Let her speak for herself. Give her a few moments to get some oxygen, and then you can kick her in the shin. So I don't think it's the NFL. I think it's college football, and they fumbled. Okay, college oh, football, and they fumbled. <laughs> All right, <laughs> loving the sports. Are coming to their defense. <laughs> I'm loving the sports metaphors here today. Let's actually look at a series of policies that we think all three, I was going to say all three, but frankly, just the Liberals and one other party can agree on that would keep this House living longer. If we look back in history, we know that Bill Davis sat atop a minority parliament that actually ran for four years, 1977 to 81. Uh, this parliament obviously couldn't last for four minutes, and that's why Dalton McGuinty felt he had to prorogue it. Howard, can you, uh, what are the series of issues upon which you think a Kathleen Wynne-led Liberal government and an Andrea Horvath-led NDP caucus can agree on to extend the life of this House? Well, you've got to, you've got to do with, deal with two issues right off the bat because they keep coming up in the media, all right? So the, I think the public still has all kinds of questions about Orange Air Ambulance. How so much money could be blowing incredible expense accounts, uh, f f government of the day saying, oh, we, we, we can't get any answers. Well, what's the agreement the two parties can make to placate that issue? I, th I think uh, you've, you've, got to f you've got to find some mechanism where you can send that off for a while. Otherwise, that will be, again, the almost everyday fodder okay, of question But it's at a parliamentary period. committee. It well, has been for well, several they've months. Clean. It's well, simple. They've got to come clean on it. They've been holding back documents and information well, right from the beginning. That's just not true. Well, we only recently, we I mean, only recently in, got, we only recently got the expense report. You might not get all the reports. We only recently got the expense report. He lives in Pussley. We only recently got the expense reports. From from uh, Dr. Mazza. So so oh here's something else another bit of orange. Okay, but hang on, My hang goodness. on, hang on. I'm bringing the gavel down here. I, what I'm looking for is we have a throne speech coming soon. What in that throne speech would Kathleen Wynne put where she knows no, no, Andrea no, no, Horvath no, no, will sign look, on? A throne, a throne speech is not going to do it. You've got issues. Well, it's the first thing you've got to pass, no, right? You've got issues that people want to hear about now, and and any attempt to sort of. Uh, you know, say, well, you know, we're not going to deal with the gas plant issue is not going to work. And any attempt to say, well, we're not going to deal with orange air is not going to work. And any attempt just to have a flowery throne speech okay. is not Tim. going to work. Martin and Tim. First of all, Mr. Hampton deserves credit because he's one of the very first MPPs in a committee who raised questions about orange and was thwarted and ignored by the government at a great cost. And we thank you for that because if I may put in a paid promo here, the Toronto Star, I think, carried the ball a little bit after that and has, and has held their feet to the fire and I'm very proud of our, my colleagues at the paper. So, so yes on orange, but Mr. Mr. Hampton as well, I'm sorry for doing this to you, but you have some good ideas on electricity. Mr. Hampton is one of the foremost authorities on electricity and power generation in this province. That should be an issue that uh, Kathleen Wynne and Andrea Horvath of the NDP as his successor can make common cause on. Here's another idea. All day long today I've heard Tim Hudak and Andrea Horvath talk about prorogation. 
four months away from the job, four months off work, why don't they do something about it? Andrew Horvath has a, has a good idea, inherited from Jack Layton, to put limits on how prorogation is used and abused. Lieutenant Governor can't do anything about it. He's, he's constrained by constitutional rules. Yeah. Politicians can, can hamstring the rules of, of, of prorogation. No one's talking about it anymore. Now that we're back in the House, NDP's not even raising that issue, and Mr. Hudak doesn't want to tinker with that at all. Andrew Horvath and Kathleen Wynne can make progress on both of those issues, prorogation and power. Tim. Well, I, I, I mean, I, Howard's kind of trying to distract with going backwards, right, to look at old issues. And I think the, the, the real question is, well, what is, and I think Martin's right, is what does she want to put on the table as a go for it? What do I want to see? It's a little bit, you've got to ask, Andrew, like, what is the vision of the province you're actually going to put forward? I mean, and, and a bit of a question as to what that is. And, but having said that, I do think, you know, there are opportunities. I think Kathleen has clearly indicated a willingness to listen. She's put some ideas like... Francis Lincoln's welfare reform paper on the paper on the table, infrastructure investments. I'm sure she'd be happy to listen on energy. I, so I think the reality is, and having been, you know, helped draft a throne speech in a minority context and done some negotiations with the NDP in the past, I mean, you, you need to have something to work with. And so I'm sure she is all ears at this moment, including with Tim Hudak, frankly. Judith, I want to find out from you. Mm -hmm. You're obviously here representing the Green Party today, and Dalton McGuinty was considered a pretty green premier, if I. I think I'm fair in saying that he took a lot of votes from your party uh, because of his uh, championing green yes, energy. Yes. Now that he's gone, are you concerned that this government will be less focused on green? We're already very concerned, completely. In Kathleen's campaign, we didn't hear anything about climate change, not one messaging about that. Even President Obama br brought it up in his inauguration speech. So where is the addressing of climate change and energy? We definitely are a little bit concerned about that. Um, I think, sorry, just off topic, but uh, for the, uh, you know, working t in terms of working together, it would be great if Kathleen could also have an overall vision for creating jobs and ec economic stability here in the country. Right now, we're not really hearing any of that from her side, and I think that's definitely a way forward in terms of bringing all the parties together. Tim, does she have a bit of a, I hate this expression, but uh, for lack of a better one, a branding problem right now, insofar as she told the Globe and Mail, I want to be the social justice premier. The candidate you back, Sandra Pupatello, said, I'm the jobs and the economy right. premier. Convention made its decision. Yep. Is that a problem for her right now? I don't think so, but I do think, you know, I, uh, Howard made a point earlier, which is right. I think she introduced herself with a speech, but I agree. The election or the framing of her isn't about a speech. It is about the series of things she does. Uh, it's a cumulative effect, and I think unquestionably the government's going to have to have something to say on jobs and the economy. She started to lay out some groundwork about, and you saw it in the interview earlier, about the need for balance, about that notion of, you know, that common ground she had with Charles, about uh, Sousa, about the notion of building towards... Uh, you know, a, a balanced budget over time, and she's reiterated that commitment. So we have, I think, she's understood that and is responding to that dynamic. I think she's going to have to in a throne speech, and I'm sure she'd love to hear Tim and Tim and Andrea's ideas uh, about how best to do that. But I do think, you know, jobs in the economy, she understands it, has to add that to the narrative, and I think she she will. Let me change focus here for a second. On on day one, the most popular liberal in the province is Kathleen Wynne. On day two the most important liberal in the province is Sandra Pupatello because she will decide whether this party comes together or whether the fights continue. I'd like to know, let me start with you Paul, based on again your experience in having to deal with these kinds of issues. Sandra Pupatello doesn't have a seat. Um, I guess theoretically you could put her in cabinet but she kind of came back to public life just to get the number one job. The number one job is not available. If you're Kathleen Wynne, what do you do about this? I would make her my campaign chair. So I would offer her that position. And if you were Sandra Pupatello, would you take it? I would leave that to Sandra Pupatello to make that decision. <laughs> uh, I would, uh, but, but I think that, that Sandra Pupatello has uh, a great role to play in the Liberal Party if Kathleen Wynne wants to offer it and if Sandra Pupatello wants to take it. Uh, but these hurt feelings and bruised egos uh, tend to cut pretty deep. And I, if you take a look at the 2002 uh, leadership in our party uh, of all the candidates who ran uh, to the second second place finisher and third place finisher left and went up to Ottawa. Uh, mm -hmm. So I mean, these are things that I wouldn't blame Senator Pupatello for a bit is to say well I gave it my best shot I worked very hard uh, I'm still a committed liberal but I'd like to go back to Bay Street and continue earning the income that I have. I wouldn't blame her one bit for that. Tim. Well, I, so Windsor politicians have a tradition of working, of being team players. I mean, you might remember Dwight uh, ran against uh, Dalton. Uh, and Dwight Duncan. Actually, uh, Dwight Duncan ran against Dalton McGuinty. He ended up going to Gerard Kennedy on the last ballot and yet ended up in his cabinet and eventually finance minister. 
played team ball throughout. Um, you know, so I don't think Sanders will be a problem, is a problem. Whether she's going to actually run again or participate, I don't know. I mean, obviously she left uh, being a cabinet minister to, to go uh, earn some money, and I understand that motivation. Uh, you know, politics is not a way to earn money. Uh, and she still needs to do that. And so I wouldn't be surprised if she did that. But I don't, you know, what you have to understand is that there was a, a whole team. There were 24 caucus members who supported her. They're all continuing to work. There's a whole lot of people. I mean, there was, this was, I don't think there's any problem at all between Sander and Kathleen at all. This was two people, great talents, competed for a job. One person got chosen. I don't think there is any issue between them at all. On stage, at the end, when they announce the results, I've never seen anything like that before in my life, where the two of them are locked arm in arm as the, I mean, it's like American Idol, for goodness sakes. <laughs> the way that they announce the, the, and the winner is, and the two of them are standing there side by each, uh, that was the classiest concession speech I think I've ever seen by Pupatello on Saturday night. But now what? Now what for her, Martin? American Idol, maybe it was Survivor. I don't watch either of them, but, I, <laughs> but I, I, it, they seem close. I think that was a magic moment, and I think that uh, Sandra Pupatella shares in the victory. Without being too cornball here, I actually think part of the excitement about this convention is that you had two strong, compelling female front runners who left the men in the dust. <laughs> Good for them. And my kids, my two girls, were so excited when, they, when I picked them up from, the Thunder Bay, uh, from Thunder Bay last night. They thought it was fantastic, and doing their girl power salutes. Uh, <laughs> so. Look, I, I think uh, Pupatella, let's not forget, was, is the campaign manager of her husband, who is a politician in Newfoundland and has tremendous campaign skills. So does her team. She had a terrific campaign manager. But let's not forget also that Kathleen Wynne was vice chair of the Liberal campaign. So what about Paul's idea? Co-chair of the next campaign? I think it's a great idea. She's not going to return to elected office. What if, if you're Kathleen could, if Wynne, do you worry that she outshines you? Because she's a bigger personality. No, uh, I think you harness her because, ca because by all accounts, and from what she kept telling us, Sandra Pupatella uh, likes to kill Tories. Uh, <laughs> metaphorically speaking, I don't want to go American on you or NFL on you, but she has that, that, that attack uh, ability to, to, to get people, um, to get them where it hurts. So why Aaron, not? what do you do about that? In some respects, you had the same problem at your convention. You uh, came I, first. What do you do about the second place person? No, I, I don't think uh, that uh, Sandra's going to be a problem at all. Look, I think Sandra was interested in the big job. Uh, the big job's not there. She can go back to Bay Street, make a lot of money, and probably w not work half as hard. Um, I think uh, Kathleen would be wise to offer her the job. Uh, I think Sandra will take it if she thinks it's interesting. Um, I don't think she's going to be a problem. Okay. I, this, for Sandra, this was an, a, a, an opportunity to run for the big job, but frankly, not have a lot to risk. So I don't think she's going to be a problem at all. I, there, there are far bigger problems, I think, uh, away Kathleen in other areas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> how, how often does it happen that the second place finisher in any leadership uh, goes on a constant campaign against the, the winner? I can't recall it what? happening. What? I mean, <laughs> all the time? No, no, no. I mean, in, in, in a very public way. I mean, they may do it quietly. Usually what happens is they withdraw and go off somewhere else. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm just, don't I'm in a, it. I, yeah, I know, you can tell, it. I'm ready to make my list, but maybe Tim's right. We have five minutes left and I'm going to bury the hatchet and move on. Here's the last issue I want to put on the table for you folks uh, to get your consideration on. The last rookie leader to unambiguously win a provincial election was Bill Davis 41 years ago. We have two sophomore leaders in Hudak and Horvath. We have a rookie leader in Wynn. Surely, she knows this, surely the liberal people around here know this. And I'd like to know from the people around this table whether you got any bright ideas for ending this jinx, which I presume you are interested in doing. Tim. Well, I think that's, uh, as I said earlier, I think Kathleen already decided one way to do that was to uh, allow some time to introduce herself to Ontarians rather than going straight to the polls to see her in governing, to see the different style. As we're already seeing that evident here. Um, you know, I mean, part of it is <laughs> you have two things, right? Ontarians want to get to know you have that sense that they can feel what kind of judgments you're going to bring to bear, uh, what kind of values you bring to the job. And so I think she's already started to, to roll that out for Ontarians. Uh, part of the problem rookie leaders have is they don't, they don't get that opportunity to see it. They want, it takes a couple of elections before they have some comfort and the accumulation of the desire for change. 
One of the, I mean, I, it's always a big challenge succeeding a long-term successful mm -hmm. serving leader, and, and history has shown that. So there's a big job ahead of Kathleen. Uh, I think she's, you know, but uh, she's up to it. I think she's the, she has the intellectual ability and the emotional honesty, I think, to do a great job. So I think it's, it comes down to the character of the person, uh, and I think she's got a great character and has a real shot at doing it. When you were a rookie leader, being province-wide, first time out the gate, that's different. You want to talk NFL? Let's NFL, right? Is she ready for that? Uh, she's an experienced cabinet minister. That's not the same as being no, a leader. It's not the same as being a leader, but she is an experienced cabinet minister who's had a, a number of positions in the government, who's had to juggle a number of important issues. So, you, you know, is, is she a rookie? Well, I, I think you know, she's a rookie who spent a fair bit of time being an understudy. Uh, but, see, I don't, I don't think those are going to be the issues. I, I think Kathleen's a, a, a good communicator. I think she's you know, reasonably smart. And I think you know, she's a person of goodwill. But I, I think the real problems are there are huge issues out there in Ontario right now. Huge issues. And I think Kathleen Wynne has a very short time to be able to present to people uh, some semblance of a plan or an idea of what she's going to do about it. How much time, Howard? Oh, I, th I think... Uh, I, 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 would give an, I would give until next fall. Late, late in, in the fall. Six months from now. I'd say six, got to have it laid out six months six from now. Six or seven months is, is the time you've got. Because if you, don't, if, if you can't put that together, as I say, there are some big issues that keep gnawing away. And what Ernie Eves found is those issues that were gnawing away, that weren't his, they were left over from the previous premier, mm -hmm. be, began to define him. She has to recognize that those issues exist. She has to recognize those issues, she has to put them in the window, and she has to make a commitment to do something about them. Not an immediate plan on how to solve the entire problem, but just recognize that they're there. Uh, and that means that she will be critical of her former boss and all of those other colleagues around the table. Now, you don't want to do that much, but to do what Howard suggests needs to be done, she's going to have to do a little. Judith. I think she needs to uh, make some critical decisions, surround herself with people who are going to help her make the right choices and be honest and stay true to herself. And I think that she'll do very well, actually. Martin. I think Paul and Howard are right. It is mission impossible, but there is a, there is a plan. <laughs> there is a plan B. I think she has to, you know, people talk about jobs on the economy. I've heard Jerry Kaplan on this show from the NDP. I've heard Dwight Duncan say, and I happen to agree, that there isn't that much a provincial government can do to, to, to magically fix jobs and the economy. So there won't be any concord with the opposition on this, and there won't be any instant magic results. So just like there isn't in other provinces. Um, I think what, what Kathleen Wynne has going for her, and she did it in her speech, is something I call AQ, authenticity quotient, mm -hmm. something that Andrew Horvath has as well. And I'm sure Mr. Hudak, I know Mr. Hudak has deep down inside, and the public doesn't always see it. Um, I think with that, she can give Ms. Horvath a run for her money. And one last thing, I think, or to, to sum that up, I think a lot of it will be personality and baggage and issues, but if she can outshine and outmaneuver the two opposition leaders, who, let's not forget, are going to be on the spotlight in an election campaign, election campaigns are not referendums, they're choices. So that's what's going to decide the next election. I want to give the uh, former party leader the last word on this program, and it's on this. As I was leaving Kathleen Wynne's news conference Sunday morning at the Delta Chelsea Hotel in downtown Toronto, a teacher came up to me and said, I was out there protesting in front of Maple Leaf Gardens, but I'm thrilled that she won. She said, I always vote NDP, but I'm thrilled Kathleen Wynne won. Is she the biggest nightmare the NDP have got going right now? Because she will probably challenge your party for those center-left votes that your party thought it probably had in the bag, given the problem with the teachers. But this starts a new chapter. No, I, uh, I think your analysis is, is far too simplistic. It's just a story. <laughs> I think it's far too simplistic on that front. Um, I, it, there's uh, always in Ontario today uh, that effort between the Liberal Party and the NDP to capture this, this left or center-left universe. Um, the, I think Kathleen will uh, make an effort uh, to capture that universe. But, but uh, that universe uh, is, uh, I think, uh, carries uh, a lot of baggage uh, in terms of the Liberal Party, in terms of promises that were made that were not kept. And, and uh, I think uh, it would take a considerable amount of time to recapture some of that turf. 
the, the real issue for Kathleen, I think, the real issue is how is she going to deal with those issues that have been left behind, which are not going to go away? How uh, is she going to deal with those over the next six or seven months and not have them define her? And we shall watch and report. Thanks to Tim Murphy, to Paul Rhodes, to Howard Hampton, Judith Van Veldhausen, and Martin Redcon for our discussion here tonight on TVO. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.